So it is now my pleasure to move on to our next speaker, um, Professor Nataki Osborne Jelks. She is an assistant professor in environmental and health sciences uh, at Spelman College in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. She investigates urban environment, uh, urban environmental health disparities, the role that place, race, and social factors play in influencing health, cumulative risk assessment, the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations, and the connection between urban watersheds, pollution, the built environment, and health. She also develops, implements, and evaluates community-based initiatives that set conditions to enable low income and communities of color to empower themselves to reduce exposure to environmental health hazards and improve health and quality of life. Dr. Jelks is particularly interested in approaches that engage environmentally overburdened communities in monitoring local environmental conditions, generating actionable data for community change and developing effective community-based interventions that revitalize toxic degraded spaces into healthy places. She has been and is involved at the local community level doing amazing work. And I would refer you to her uh, bio, uh, which is listed on our program. Um, but I wanna just say that she studied chemistry and civil and environmental engineering at Spelman College and the Georgia Institute of Technology respectively before earning a master's of environmental and occupational health degree at Emory University and a PhD in public health at Georgia State University. Uh, the title of her talk today is Climate Justice and Environmental Health Disparities, Amplifying Grassroots Struggles. Please welcome Dr. Jelks to this wonderful conference. Welcome Dr. Jelks. Thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, very warm introduction. I'm so appreciative uh, of the invitation to be here, and um, I will get started. It's, it's an honor uh, also to uh, follow Dr. Uh, Ajaman. I have studied his work for a number of years and used uh, just sustainabilities in um, my sustainable development class, so it's just a, a delight to be able to, to hear him. So thank you again for the opportunity to share. I want to talk a little bit about climate justice uh, and environmental health disparities. I'll talk about it from um, my vantage point as an environmental health scientist. Um, but sometimes I think maybe I should have been, you know, an urban planner. Uh, I like to work on these issues um, around environmental health and uh, equity and justice um, as they intersect, you know, with the, the built environment in particular. So a lot of my work, um, I think is applicable, um, you know, both uh, to public health, but also uh, to urban planning. So let's get started. I thought I would, you know, sort of begin this talk um, in kind of positioning you all um, just kind of where I am from my vantage point. And I'll, I'll make a lot of references to Atlanta and to Georgia because that's where I am. Um, but also because I think there are some good illustrations um, as we think about issues of climate justice as well as environmental justice. So one of the things that um, I think about as an environmental health scientist, um, when I think about climate change are the health effects that are associated with it. And I think about the health effects that are associated with pollution. And Georgia is, the home, is home to three of the nation's largest dirty coal plants. When I think about those vulnerable populations, I'm thinking of children of pregnant women or those who are trying to become pregnant. Uh, I'm thinking about those who live and work around these coal fire burning, um, coal, coal burning power plants um, being at highest risk. Um, and, and when I think about these vulnerable communities, I think it's really important to recognize um, that there are not communities that are innately vulnerable. And um, my colleague and, and Shiro, Dr. Fatima Shafi, says this all the time. She is an associate professor at Spelman College and is a um, 
national, nationally known um, expert on environmental justice uh, and environmental politics. Um, and she sort of talks about this, um, the, the fact that um, we are not innately vulnerable. Vulnerability is not in our DNA, but there are policies and structures in place um, that have rendered certain community, communities more, more vulnerable than others. Now, in addition to that, we do typically think about children uh, and pregnant women and women uh, trying to become pregnant as parts of our vulnerable populations, as well as senior citizens. But I wanted to try to, try to make that distinction um, with respect to the fact that um, with the exception you know, of um, children and pregnant women and the elderly and those that we think about uh, in terms of these critical windows of development for children. Um, you know, when women obviously are carrying children, uh, they are vulnerable. Uh, senior citizens are gonna be more vulnerable because they are um, sort of at the opposite end, you know, of the spectrum, um, immune system, systems might be breaking down and that sort of thing. So we think about them as vulnerable, but everybody else um, is really made to be vulnerable by a number of different factors. And we'll talk about some of those today. So again, from the health perspective, um, as we look at the impact of air pollution on children's health, and so I'm, I'm now correlating um, you know, air pollution with uh, some of the climate impacts that many communities experience. Um, when a child is exposed to unsafe levels of pollution, um, there can be a lifetime of health impacts. Um, exposure in the womb or in early childhood can lead to a number of adverse health outcomes, including things like stunted lung growth, reduced lung function, increased risk of developing asthma, impaired mental and motor development, behavioral disorders, low birth weight, um, premature birth, and even infant mortality childhood cancers, the increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, and stroke in, in adulthood, um, as well as acute lower respiratory infections. When we think about our children, um, there are a number of school systems across the country that are still unfortunately trying to get rid of these dirty polluting diesel buses. And so when children are riding these buses, um, they're being exposed um, to particulate matter um, and pollution coming out of the tailpipes. But beyond pollution, there are other climate change risks that we have to be, that we have to consider. Um, you know, obviously we're concerned about uh, toxic pollutants, um, but fossil fuel combustion in particular increases the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that causes things like hotter temperatures, more intense extreme weather, rising sea levels. Um, and as I, you know, talk today, I am remembering uh, in, in my heart, um, our friends and our family members and fellow Americans who are in the Gulf Coast region, uh, in uh, New Orleans and surrounding communities. Um, I have a brother in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Thank God um, all is well for him. But we know that so many are just struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. Um, a friend earlier today in New York um, was talking about the flooding there um, and how um, just, you know, in a span of a couple of months, um, she's lost, you know, a vehicle um, and other property because of the floods. And unfortunately, um, there are some people who have suffered injury and even death as a result of these incidents. So climate change connects to many different health outcomes. When we think about those human exposures, we're thinking about things like changes in regional weather. Uh, weather. Um, we're thinking about the heat waves, the extreme weather, temperature, um, precipitation, all of the things, unfortunately, that we have been watching uh, for a number of months now here in the United States. Um, and so those health effects, you know, are things like temperature related illness and death, extreme weather related health effects uh, and, you know, um, extreme heat, you know, is one of the, the reasons that we see so many injuries and deaths in this country. Um, it's a kind of a little known fact. Um, but this summer, I definitely have seen a lot more news coverage about it. Um, it seems like these issues are being elevated a little bit more than they have been in the past. We can also think about air pollution related health effects, water and food borne diseases, vector and rodent borne diseases, um, as well as effects on food and water shortages uh, and population displacement. The impacts of, impacts of climate change on human health are far reaching. Um, and, and this is uh, shows some of the things that may have been on the last slide, but I'd like to just pull out a few other things here as we really think about climate change in the global context. Um, 
you know, just, you know, in the United States, as well as in other countries, we're seeing this forced, you know, migration or displacement. We don't talk enough about um, things like um, mental health impacts and the trauma uh, associated with um, living through and experiencing these extreme weather events. Um, there's also heat related illness and death. Uh, cardiovascular failure. Um, there can be water quality impacts that then trickle down into health. Changes in vector ecology. Um, and we're seeing you know, an increase in things like West Nile virus uh, in places where we didn't see it in the past. Um, just as one example, um, in Atlanta, I can definitely attest to the increasing allergens um, with a longer, you know, growing season for a lot of the species that, um, you know, kind of cause hay fever and, you know, uh, emit a lot of pollen and, and that sort of thing. Our health is, is harmed by climate change um, based on where we live. And so we see some difference in impacts based on the geographic regions. So look at this map. And if you're in the United States, see what's, what's happening in your region. Um, because I live in Atlanta in the Southeast, um, you know, we have um, mosquito and tick-borne infections uh, on the increase, uh, extreme temperatures, uh, extreme events like flooding, hurricanes, storms, and drought, um, outdoor air quality issues, um, water-related infections, um, as well as mental health uh, and well-being. Um, but check out your area of the country if you're in the United States. Um, and I think you'll see really um, a lot of similarities across these different geographies. So to talk about Atlanta just a little bit, um, when we look uh, a little bit ahead um, to the year 2050 um, and compare the intensity of climate hazards uh, now and then, um, we see an increase in um, five different categories, precipitation, warming, water deficit, drought, as well as heat waves. And as we think about flooding um, in the context of all of the flooding that um, people are experiencing right now uh, in, in New York in the Northeast, in the Gulf Coast region, um, we have to recognize that um, climate drivers like increased precipitation lead to flooding. Um, it can lead to not only contaminated water, um, but a number of other environmental hazards, um, as well as waterborne infection. Um, not to mention the loss of property, um, not to mention in some cases the loss of lives, um, people you know, need to essentially rebuild uh, themselves, their lives, uh, they've lost property. Um, sometimes they've lost um, pets and others who are close to them. And so the impacts are far reaching. This is a picture from 2009. This is actually um, right outside of the city of Atlanta um, in the Atlanta suburbs um, in, in Mableton, Georgia. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing heavy, you know, rain events that lead to either localized flooding or really heavy, heavy flooding events. And so 2009 was one of those years. It seems like every few years we're beginning to experience uh, things that look like this. And not just in Atlanta, but in other parts of, the, of Georgia, as well as uh, other parts of the southeast. So if we begin to connect these dots, um, so we just talked a little bit about flooding, uh, pre increased precip precipitation and flooding. Um, let's also connect the dots with respect to higher temperatures. Um, we know that you know, um, air pollution and specifically um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide in particular, is a driver of climate change in this country. Um, and so some air pollutants uh, like carbon dioxide um, are, green, are also greenhouse gases. Um, these greenhouse gases are essentially um, you know, uh, serving as a blanket you know, around the earth, leading to these hotter temperatures. Um, but not only that, climate change can make air pollution worse. Um, it's all connected. Um, just using exam Atlanta as a test case uh, or case study again, um, we see here in, on, on this uh, graph um, that we have, you know, almost 20 more days, warm spring days um, above normal. Uh, we had them, them in 2020 than we did in 1970. So you can see in a relatively short period of time that things are really creeping up and they're changing quite a bit. Um, when we look at the number of days above um, 90 degrees, um, we're also seeing over 20 more days um, over 90 degrees. We actually this summer um, have not had it 
that bad uh, just yet. We have had several days over 90. Um, and with the humidity and the heat index, it's felt like it was in um, the low 100s. Um, but we haven't quite hit, you know, 100 degrees um, yet this summer. Um, and, and that's something we have experienced in the past. But we do know that uh, folks in other parts of the country um, have hit that milestone this summer already. So we see a longer growing season in places like Atlanta, um, which equals a, long, a longer allergy season. So there are a number of health related impacts that are associated with climate change. And I really don't have the time to go through all of them, but I wanted to spotlight a few. Here again, looking at the time period between 1970 and 2020, we have 30, 31 more days uh, in our growing season here in Atlanta, um, which is leading uh, to a lot more um, pollen you know, in the atmosphere um, and that impacts a number of folks, um, especially people who might already uh, be challenged with some underlying health conditions related to their respiratory health. So as I lay out these various um, challenges um, with respect to health, um, you know, I, I want to, you know, acknowledge that the impacts are far reaching, they are beyond health. Um, but from my vantage points, you know, I wanted to emphasize those. But whether we're talking about challenges that are related to health, um, whether we're talking about um, ec our, our economic status, um, whether we're talking about the, the quality of our local environments, um, it's important to realize that with respect to climate change impacts, we are all in the same storm. None of us are immune from these impacts um, as we look across the country, as we look across the world. Um, but even though we're all in the same storm, we are not in the same boat. Certain communities are bearing the brunt uh, of these climate change impacts. Certain communities have been made to be more vulnerable. So as we look at this um, diagram from the US Environmental Protection Agency, um, you see exposure, sensitivity, and ability to adapt. And all of this feeds into vulnerability, um, whether or not populations will be vulnerable to climate change with respect to health uh, outcomes, and, and we could extend this beyond health. Um, when we talk about exposure, we're, we're talking about uh, the contact between a person and one or more biological, psychosocial, chemical, or physical stressors, including stressors that are affected by climate change. So flooding, for instance, could be one of those. The sensitivity is then the degree to, to which people or communities are, are affected, um, either adversely or beneficially, if, if that were the case, um, by their exposure to climate variability or change. And what we see a lot of challenges with on top of um, kind of the disproportionate impact that some communities um, are facing and experiencing with respect to um, you know, greenhouse gas pollution um, and other you know, pollution sources that are tied to climate change um, is that this, um, the systems in our country have made it so that some communities are not able to adapt um, in, in the same way that you know, others who have more resources um, might be able to. Um, and so if we don't have, a, if we have a weakened ability to adapt, um, then that is leading to greater vulnerabilities in terms of health outcomes and in terms of other um, outcomes that are important um, to our quality of life. Here, just kind of breaking down this idea of vulnerability um, a little bit more. Um, we see climate drivers, exposure pathways, health impacts, and then we're ending up with health outcomes. So when we look at exposure, for instance, um, people in poor neighborhoods are generally more likely to be exposed to climate change health threats. Um, Professor Ajerman talked about historically red line neighborhoods and exposure to extreme heat because many of those neighborhoods in cities across this country are the ones um, where we don't have as much tree canopy. Um, Atlanta is no different. Um, we see that happening uh, or we see that, you know, uh, we see that phenomenon taking place here in the Atlanta area. Uh, when we think about exposure, we also have to think about what we call the social determinants of health. Um, things like poverty, um, you know, the jobs that people have, the income levels that they have, um, racial discrimination that um, takes many forms, um, especially in terms of um, how cities were shaped, uh, the policies and practices, and in many cases, racialized politics. Um, you know, formulated a lot of policies, like even policies around things like redlining. 
And when we think about sensitivity, we've got to think about, you know, those folks who have underlying health conditions or are experiencing some other types of underlying health disparities. Um, and then the adaptive capacity, you know, do people, are people living in poverty? Do they have access to quality education? Uh, are they able to influence, um, you know, public policy and government um, to make policies in the best interest um, of those communities who have been made to be most vulnerable? Um, do they have access to care? Um, if they don't, these are the folks who are experiencing the adverse health outcomes. Again, we're all affected by this storm, but we're definitely not all in the same boat. So I approach my work from a frame of environmental justice. And um, I would you know, like to posit climate justice as environmental justice. Um, when, we, when we talk about climate justice, I'm focusing on the root causes of climate change. I'm focusing on making systemic changes that are, are required to address the unequal burdens um, to our communities and to realign our economy with natural systems. Um, we see, you know, kind of a, it's, it's a cycle uh, in terms of, you know, there was a conversation earlier about capitalism um, and, you know, capitalism drives this system um, that produces these inequitable, um, you know, impacts for certain communities. As a form of environmental justice, climate justice really means that all species have the right to access and obtain the resources needed, um, you know, really to advance their, their quality of life, to have an equal chance of survival and freedom, you know, from discrimination. And as a movement, climate justice advocates are working from the grassroots up to try to cre create solutions to our climate and energy problems, um, you know, pollution related problems, all of these things that are associated with climate change to ensure the rights of, of all people to live, to learn, to work, play, and pray in safe, healthy, and clean neighborhoods. Really important points. So some people would say that their neighborhood uh, is killing them. And so that might seem to be a bit drastic, but just ask the folks in Flint, Michigan, who are still struggling um, with access to clean, to clean water. Um, you know, in, in Flint, the process has started to you know, replace some of the lead service lines, um, but it isn't happening fast enough. Families are still you know, depending on bottled water in some cases for their everyday needs to carry out their everyday needs. So imagine that burden of having to cook, having to bathe, having to brush your teeth, um, having to you know, prepare large meals maybe for family you know, on holidays like Thanksgiving or Christmas or other um, holidays, you know, um, that uh, communities might, uh, might celebrate or observe based on um, religious or faith, you know, beliefs and practices. Um, think about that burden. I hail from, uh, um, from Mississippi originally, but I spent a number of years living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is a part of the Cancer Alley corridor. Um, and so here in Cancer Alley, um, you have over 134 or so chemical companies, petrochemical companies, and other pollution generating facilities that um, are, are in close proximity to where people live. Um, in many cases, people live along the fence lines of some of these facilities. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to grow up in a middle class neighborhood, but we were not immune to these types of facilities. Um, this is a photograph from Norco, Louisiana, um, where the industry has literally moved within 25 feet of where people live. Um, and one of the things that the industry did was, you know, create a basketball court uh, for the children in the, in the community. Um, but if you think about it, um, how, how safe is it for our young people to play basketball as the pollution billows from the smokestacks? These are the types of things when we think about air pollution that cause um, challenges with respiratory health in many parts of the country uh, when uh, communities of color and low income communities and urban uh, you know, communities are exposed to different types of air pollution. We have higher rates of asthma, uh, different types of respiratory illnesses that impact people in those populations. 
this photograph is actually within a mile um, of my home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I actually have family who still live there. My brother is there with his family. Um, but again, um, even you know, in a middle-class neighborhood, we were not immune uh, from exposure to these facilities. Um, we just did not um, have it as intensely um, as uh, our neighbors in the Cancer Alley corridor who were living right along the fence lines of these facilities. So I studied the urban environment, but we could talk about the rural environment um, as well. Um, and the urban environment and the environment period really is a determinant of health. So what is in our environment impacts our health. So drawing from my, you know, southern roots again, um, I want to, you know, just um, sort of elevate this idea um, again of, you know, the dirty south, which is a uh, um, this this phrasing comes from um, a, a rap song um, by a group, an Atlanta based group called um, the Goody Mob. Um, so they had a song back in the late 1990s called the Dirty South. And so they were talking about um, lots of issues, you know, uh, some issues around, you know, the police and um, you know, kind of uh, the, the three strikes you're out drug laws and things like that. But we could take this same uh, concept of the dirty South and really talk about the Southeast United States. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about, about Georgia. When we think about the South, though, it has a legacy of unequal protection. And Dr. Robert Bullard, who is known as um, the, uh, the father of the environmental justice movement says, you know, why would the environment be any different? We can look across the board at things like voting rights, um, you know, stuff that is happening right now in real time, you know, a, a huge assault, you know, on voting rights, uh, in part uh, in response um, to what Georgians did, you know, at the, at the ballot box earlier this year um, by changing our representation um, in terms of those who are representing Georgia um, in the U.S. Senate. It. Um, so, you know, whether it's voting rights or the environment, um, this, the South has this legacy of unequal protection. And so some might say that the system is broken, but I submit to you that the system isn't broken. It was built this way. Again, historic uh, and uh, historic racism, um, systemic racism, structural racism is, has shaped um, our country. It has shaped Atlanta, which is known largely as a, as a Black city, um, but we still have some policies and practices in place that were implemented years ago that um, impact the inequities that people experience today. Um, one of those is with respect to pollution. And in 2012, there was a study called the Patterns of Pollution that looked at demographics uh, and pollution sources in metropolitan Atlanta. It looked at a, four, a 14 county metropolitan Atlanta area. Um, and in the study, it was found that there were 52 environmental justice hotspots in this 14 county area. And so the hotspots are located in red. These are the places where you have multiple pollution sources, but you have um, some level of social vulnerability. So you may have low, in low income communities, communities of color, maybe language isolated communities, um, but some sort of social Social vulnerability overlaid, um, you know, with the the environmental hazards. Um, so, from a framework of cumulative risks and impacts, you know, these are the communities that have high social vulnerability as well as high environmental vulnerability, given um, the pollution hazards. They also identified about fourteen environmental justice cold spots. These are the boxes that are in blue. These are places where there were multiple pollution sources found. However, um, you have um, you, you have um, you don't have the same level of social vulnerability. So higher income, you know, communities, communities that have uh, more access to to resources, maybe even um, more access to the political system in some cases um, to try to you know fight against or to change their realities. Um, more so than communities who you know are struggling with this with few resources uh, and some of our more socially vulnerable communities. This is a map of the county that I live in. So the city of Atlanta is located um, within this circled area. Um, and these numbers are the county commission districts. But you can quickly see um, 
from this map that while there are sources of, of pollution in different parts of the county, there are certain areas where there is a higher concentration of this accumulation of hazardous waste sites, solid waste sites, toxic release inventory sites, um, wastewater treatment facilities, um, et cetera. And these are the places where you see this, um, uh, the more uh, densely you know, populated areas um, or more densely, um, densely um, you know, sort of situated with these pollution sources. Um, these are the areas that are um, more black uh, than, the, than other areas on this map. Um, as well as uh, lower income. Now, I don't want to paint the city of Atlanta um, as a low income city, but we are the poster child for income inequality. So we've got, um, you know, the really high income levels and the really low income levels. Um, so when we talk about Atlanta, it's almost like this tale of two cities, even. Um, our current mayor uh, ran uh, for election under the moniker, you know, one Atlanta, trying to bring Atlanta together. Uh, unfortunately, what we find um, is that we still have a number of challenges despite um, her efforts to try to address these issues. When we talk about life expectancy, for, for instance, um, the highest average life expectancy in metropolitan Atlanta, and this is from a study of about five core counties um, out of the 14 that I showed you on the other map, kind of the five core counties um, of the metropolitan Atlanta area, the highest level of life expectancy um, is in um, the Vinings area, which is in a county um, that neighbors um, Atlanta. Um, it's called Cobb County. Um, so that's the highest average life expectancy in metropolitan Atlanta at 87.6 years. The lowest is, is for those who live in the Bankhead neighborhood, which is in the city of Atlanta. It was in that circle that we just saw on the last map with all of those pollution sources. This same community um, is one of the top five um, environmental justice hotspots in the other map that I showed you. Um, communities uh, or you know the, the people who live uh, in the Bankhead area um, are you know largely you know lower income. Um, you know, black residents um, save, you know, the gentrification that is currently happening. Um, so those dynamics and the demographics are changing just a bit. But see this, there is a 24 year difference in life expectancy from folks in the Vinings neighborhood and people who live in Bankhead. A 24 year difference in life expectancy. Now, while these are different counties, we're talking about areas that are less than 10 miles away from each other less than 10 miles away from each other. Some people are dying closer to 64 years of age and others are making it almost to 88. There's something wrong with this. Again, the system is not broken. It was, it was built to produce these types of inequities. So as I began to um, kind of move toward my close, I wanted to share just a couple of examples um, of what local communities are doing. So in that Bankhead neighborhood that I just mentioned, um, there is a resource called Proctor Creek. Um, and Proctor Creek is it's beginning to be sort of a household word in the city of Atlanta. Um, this is a, a creek, a water resource uh, on the west side of Atlanta that um, has been you know, historically a, a source of pride for West Atlanta communities, um, a place where children played, where people fished and swam, and where people were actually baptized. Um, today, the creek is one of Atlanta's uh, most environmentally impaired streams, um, and it has been high, uh, elevated um, for national attention by being placed on the Urban Waters Federal Partnership list, which is a list of about 19 different locations across the country um, that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and other federal agencies invested in primarily um, during the Obama administration and a little into the, the Trump administration as well, although a lot of that support has, um, has been dialed back a bit. Um, Proctor Creek, you know, again, this place where children play, people fished, and, you know, I will say that anecdotally, we know that kids still play there, people still fish there. I don't think that people are um, 
ex, uh, having baptisms there, but people are still swimming in this creek. And it's one of our most impaired uh, in the metropolitan Atlanta area. It should be a creek that is suitable for fishing, um, but it doesn't man, uh, meet its state mandated water quality requirements. So it does not support that designation as a fishable stream. E. coli bacteria is one of the contaminants coming from some of our uh, polluting infrastructure in the city. Um, as we think about this infrastructure bill, you know, in Congress, um, you know, cities like Atlanta are still dealing with this older infrastructure um, that uh, pollutes our waterways and our communities and our homes um, when we have heavy rain events. And we see that uh, the heavy rain events and the precipitation is increasing. And so we have raw untreated sewage mixed with stormwater that flows into our creeks and streams and sometimes into homes when we have those heavy rain events. This is one example um, of one of those heavy rain events uh, impacting uh, people where they live. And so residents uh, in the Proctor Creek watershed, as well as in other communities, front frontline communities across the country have begun to respond um, to these issues, whether they are approaching it from a lens of climate justice or just from you know, a lens of environmental justice. Um, communities are engaging in a community-based participatory research, um, there are some communities who are engaged in something called community owned and managed research, um, whatever it is that we call it. Um, the idea is that communities are a part of the research process and they are a part of the change process in their communities. And when we talk about these different types of participatory um, research processes and approaches, um, we're not talking about science in a traditional way. We're not talking about research in a traditional sense in which we're just trying to find some sort of generalizable knowledge. Um, you know, while generalizable knowledge is important, we're also looking to make some targeted changes in policy, in practice, uh, or in whatever it's going to take to make communities cleaner, greener, healthier, and more sustainable. So one example from my work in the Potter Creek watershed, and this is, um, I lived at, actually recently moved um, to the neighboring watershed, but for most of the uh, over 20 years that I've lived in the city of Atlanta, I've lived in the Proctor Creek watershed, um, went to college in the Proctor Creek watershed, um, and I continue to work um, in this watershed to uh, try to improve health and quality of life, to help residents um, with their goals uh, to restore Proctor Creek so that it is playable, fishable, and swimmable in a safe manner once again. Um, and we really see that the restoration of the watershed um, relating directly to the restoration of the community and to the people within it. Um, so one thing that community residents or community scientists, as we call them, have done in Proctor Creek um, or to create some digital tools, um, working with uh, colleges and universities and with students in particular, um, we've co-designed um, a set of meaningful street level environmental health indicators um, to capture data about, um, to track, um, and the community found it necessary to do this because they were taking concerns and claims uh, to city officials who did nothing about it. In some cases, the city officials said, we have no idea what you're talking about. We don't know where this illegal dumping is. We don't know where all the tires are dumped. Um, we don't know of any places where um, it has flooded since 2002 or 2009 when we had those really big floods. We have no you know, evidence that there's this localized flooding that happens even on some of these smaller events. Um, we, we don't know anything about um, you know, the, the lack of um, or, or the inadequacies of our stormwater infrastructure in certain parts of the city. So community residents decided, well, let's, let's map this. Let's capture this information. Let's put it in a, a geocoded database um, that will allow city officials and others to see not only what these hazards are, these hidden hazards, you know, if people can't see them, maybe they're hidden, but we want to highlight them. We want to bring them to the light of day and we want to show them where they are spatially um, and we want to make some we want some action um, as a result of this and so this was a part of a, a research project, but it was really so much more than that, um, that yes, you know, we captured, you know, great information about where the hazards were, um, but then we used that as a part of the agenda, um, policy agenda to get the city to act um, to clean up some of these sites. 
Uh, on other issues that we're kind of tackling locally, um, uh, Professor Ajman talked about, again, urban heat islands, and he talked about the historically redlined neighborhoods. And so um, we have this same profile in Atlanta as many other cities, um, where it's hotter in the downtown areas, it's harder in those places, uh, hotter, excuse me, in the places that have been, um, you know, highly developed and built up where we don't necessarily have a lot of tree canopy and cover although Atlanta is known as a city uh, in the forest because of the tremendous you know, um, forested resources that we have here, we still have some communities um, who don't have enough access to those types of resources. And so um, you know, in the communities that are closest to the downtown area, in many instances, uh, some of the historically redlined communities, black neighborhoods are where we're seeing um, a lack of tree canopy, some of the lowest percentages of tree canopy uh, in the city. And so, um, you know, in the context of those types of conditions, we've got to think about heat waves, you know, heat stress, um, heat strokes, um, you know, all of the things that people experience when it's hot. Um, people who don't have air conditioning, um, people who, you know, may not be able to afford it, maybe it's broken, they don't have the money to fix it, the elderly, those who are on fixed incomes, um, or those in some cases who might just be trying to um, keep their costs down um, because of the fact that they suffer from high energy burden. Um, in, in the city of Atlanta, we have a number of zip codes that are um, experiencing extreme energy burden, um, meaning that people are paying a very large percentage of their monthly income to pay for electricity bills. So sometimes people might elect um, to not turn their air conditioning on or to not use it enough um, so that they can, you know, keep their bills down. Um, and that can potentially have health effects, you know, if it's one of those during one of those times where the heat is extremely, um, you know, high and, and unbearable. Um, and, and those who already have certain types of underlying conditions, um, like heart problems, you know, asthma, those who are um, homeless, um, and we have a very healthy homeless population, unfortunately, here in the city of Atlanta. Um, so these are the folks who are going to be vulnerable to extreme heat. So what are we doing about it? Uh, in another community engaged effort, um, I am co-leading a project called Urban Heat ATL. Um, and um, I am at Spelman College, which is a historically black college and university um, for women. Um, we are partnering with the Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech, um, as well as the city of Atlanta um, and community-based organizations um, like the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, um, Partnership for Southern Equity and others. Um, and we have been since since March of this year, um, mapping heat islands um, across the city of Atlanta. Um, so we have been deploying um, students from both of those two institutions, as well as community members, um, to map temperature, um, kind of at the, at the street level, at the ground level almost, um, with handheld uh, sensors. Um, and this was important to us because we know that urban heat islands disproportionately affect uh, vulnerable community members um, and that heat extremes are particularly deadly in densely populated urban centers such as Atlanta. Um, other cities have done these types of studies. Um, some cities have looked at satellite imagery, um, you know, to understand, um, you know, what's happening in terms of temperatures. Um, you know, other cities have um, you know, had sensors mounted to cars and bikes, um, like we are actually planning to do this Saturday um, as a part of a, a new campaign. Um, but we have been um, just deploying people to the streets um, where they, uh, in the communities where they live, uh, on their college campuses with these handheld uh, kind of pocket sensors um, that um, it, it has a, a external temperature probe as well as a, a temperature sensor on the inside of this little box contraption. Um, and so we are um, using this um, to map what's going on. And so we're able to see, you know, even these small changes in temperature as we, you know, um, travel through neighborhoods, we're able to see some of the differences in the neighborhoods that are heavily forested versus those who are not. Um, and, and even, you know, those neighborhoods where there is perhaps a lot of truck traffic, um, there is uh, more pollution. Um, and we're, you know, beginning to understand how that, of course, is tying into to temperatures. Uh, this Saturday, I mentioned we are um, colleagues at Spelman um, 
are leading this effort um, and working with uh, colleagues at Georgia Tech, Emory University, the city of Atlanta and community-based organizations um, to work with NOAA, um, the government agency. Uh, and NOAA has supplied us with sensors that can be mounted to vehicles and to bikes. And so we will be driving around Atlanta to get a one day snapshot of what temperature is looking like. Um, again, across various neighborhoods, this is another approach that is gonna get us a little bit more fine grained data than you know, some of the satellite data would give us. Um, and it's also very community engaged. You know, we have students uh, involved as well as community members from across Atlanta neighborhoods who have signed up um, to volunteer to collect data as a part of this effort. And so I, I wanted to share those things um, as, I, as I close. And I have just two, two or three more slides here. Um, I want to make uh, sort of just a, a kind of a, a hard shift, you know, from talking about what communities are doing, um, what community engaged projects are happening, where you have partnerships between academic institutions and community based organizations, um, to just saying um, that you know, women have really been shouldering and leading the fight for environmental justice as well as climate justice in this country. And so I want to close out sort of giving homage uh, to some of those women. Um, many social movements have been sustained um, in my opinion, by nameless, faceless women who have received little or no recognition for their contributions, for what they're doing behind the scenes um, or for or their sustaining forces in these movements. Uh, women have been the ones who have started uh, to cause the dust of change to rise um, as it relates to these challenges. Um, and so here, um, while I don't have time to, to go through the biographies of each of these women, um, I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, in the center top photo um, is Hazel Johnson, who is deceased now, um, but she was known as the mother of environmental justice. Um, she lived in Chicago, Illinois. Um, in in a public housing facility called Outgad Gardens. And her daughter, Cheryl Johnson, um, lives there today and is carrying on the fight um, that Hazel led um, with her organization, People for Community Recovery. Um, I have uh, in the bottom middle, uh, my shero, Dr. Mildred McLean, who was with Harambe House and Citizens for Environmental Justice in Savannah, Georgia. Um, look her up, Google her, listen to uh, her words in, in one of her riveting um, addresses, um, you know, whether it be to, to folks in DC uh, or in the local community. And she has been a warrior on the battlefield working for environmental and climate justice in a coastal community in Savannah, Georgia. So we talk about those impacts of things like sea level rise. She is on the forefront of this work. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Yampier, who is um, in the picture with her fist up, um, she is in uh, the Bronx, New York, uh, with an organization called Uprose, um, and she is a um, a very um, you know um, memorable voice, um, clear clarion voice, I should say, uh, in terms of the climate justice movement uh, and working on issues for, for um, black and brown people, not only um, in her community, um, but across this country and world. Um, and then this is my, my sort of final slide here. Uh, there are a number of amazing women here, um, but I'll just highlight um, Margie um, Richard, who is in um, the bottom, uh, bottom row uh, in the middle. Um, she lives in actually Destrehan, Louisiana now, but she grew up and lived in Norco, Louisiana. And she was so bold as to challenge um, the Shell Company, Shell Oil Company that was um, about 25 feet away from her home. She went to a shareholders meeting. She worked to collect air samples um, to, to demonstrate that what the pollution that Shell was putting out was negatively impacting this community. And she was able to get community members who wanted to leave relocated um, away from the toxic pollution. They couldn't shut down the facility, but they were able to move people away from that pollution. And there's so many other women here who I just don't have time enough to, um, to tell their stories, um, but I wanted to, to share this because women are leading this movement, women of color are leading this movement, and as we talk about amplifying these grassroots struggles, um, I had to um, just pay my, um, um, my uh, just pay gratitude um, to the work that these amazing women do on a daily basis. 
Um, so this is my contact information um, and I will close this out and sh stop sharing my screen and see if we have um, any questions. Dr. Jelps, thank you so much for your presentation and what an impressive uh, example you give us with your work as the co-founder of the West Atlantic Watershed Alliance, uh, which is this community-based uh, environmental justice organization that you uh, work with at the grassroots level. Uh, that presents a very good example to the rest of us as to measures that we can begin to consider uh, in terms of environmental justice. Um, we have uh, one question from Connie Siebold. There seems to be a lot of citizen science solutions and efforts shown here. Do you think that the crowdsourced data is going to serve a more prominent role in pressuring positive policy action going forward as opposed to traditional lobbying efforts? What a great question. Um, I, I think that um, it, it's kind of a both and. So I, I think that those traditional lobbying efforts and educating our decision makers and holding them accountable um, and community, you know, just regular old grassroots community organizing needs to continue. But increasingly in my work and in the work of my peers in different parts of the country, I am seeing um, this citizen and community science generated data um, take on a more prominent um, position. Now, I I will say that in in you know many places you talk about you know community science or citizen generated data not everybody you know sort of takes that data as the bible if you will but what i have seen it do is to um you know, force, um, you know, maybe municipalities. We've seen this in the city of Atlanta with some of the community collected water quality data. The city didn't take that, that data, you know, as the Bible and say, okay, since you've found, since community members have found, you know, sewage pollution uh, at, you know, um, really high levels, you know, we're not going to take that as, as the Bible, but what we will do is we'll invest our own money um, into, you know, doing the testing ourselves. And when they did, they found the same results that the community had found. Uh, and quite honestly, um, because the city is structured in a way that, you know, with our water resources, they're not able to do kind of these full evaluations of these various water basins, um, except for once every five years, this community, you know, science data um, is calling their attention to things that they, you know, they missed and they will likely continue to miss um, if they, you know, are not able to change, you know, the frequency of when they do their own testing. So, you know, in that case, and there have been some cases, you know, some other cases where, you know, kind of the, um, you know, like with the, the instance with Shell in Norco, Louisiana, um, mm -hmm. you know, that there was some pressure, you know, put on that company because, um, citizens have been using these, you know, buckets, um, air sampling buckets, you know, to, um, you know, collect, um, you know, air quality data. And so, you know, they were able to push, you know, um, you know, authorities, um, you know, at the federal level, as well as, you know, put a lot, apply a lot of pressure to Shell, where they, you know, kind of backed off. Um, I won't say backed off, but they delivered some of what the community wanted to see in terms of at least moving away from that pollution. So I say all that to say that I do think that this type of data is going to be a lot more prominent moving forward. Um, it's not to say that it's going to always be easy to get that data, you know, seen as, as, as you know, quality data, but there are things within kind of the Justice 40 initiative that the Biden administration has put forward um, that will actually make some investments uh, in air monitoring equipment and resources that will be made available to communities to help them do some of their own monitoring. So that says to me, um, if we're going to put that money you know, into the community's hands, then we're going to be paying a lot more attention to that type of data moving forward. Thank you. Um, Dr. Seaman, do you have a question? I do. Um, so I was wondering, um, I found your example of the case of Norco in Louisiana interesting and this ability to pressure um, from being able to move away from the pollution. I'm wondering, um, what the responses of other companies have been in similar situations? Has there been an increased response um, in in relation to kind of public awareness campaigns around these? Um, and are there any kind of lessons learned um, for pressure groups to to take away from those examples to then apply in other situations? 
Good question. Good question. So in terms of other companies, so there has been, um, and this was some time ago in uh, Pensacola, Florida, um, there was another situation where communities were fighting um, for relocation. Um, there was a group called uh, Communities Against Toxic Pollution um, or Against a Toxic Environment and a woman named Margaret Williams, and she was one of the, the pictures. She's deceased now, but she fought to get her community relocated um, and was successful in, in uh, being able to do that. There was kind of a pesticide formulation plant and some other facilities, um, and so they were able to um, get, you know, relocated. So that's one example. Um, in another Louisiana case, Case, um, there was a Shintech um, facility um, that wanted to come in. And so you had uh, Imelda, a woman named Imelda West, also deceased now. She was one of the pictures um, who helped to lead a grassroots campaign um, to really to essentially sh shut that the plan down. You know, they wanted to, to build this new facility in Convent, Louisiana. Um, the community was already um, uh, inundated with other pollution generating facilities, and they were able to, um, you know, get um, the local NWCP involved and, you know, work with elected officials, and they were able to apply enough pressure that that facility was not built. So those are just a few other examples that were led by women in particular. Um, one other example I'll mention that wasn't led by a woman, but is, is an extraordinary example uh, in Spartanburg, North Car uh, South Carolina, excuse me. And um, you can, uh, if you type in, you know, kind of Spartanburg environmental justice, uh, or there was a group, there is a group called Regenesis led by um, a friend of mine, Harold Mitchell. Um, and he worked to bring a number of uh, industries to the table. Uh, he leveraged, you know, small $20,000 environmental justice grants from the EPA and turned it into millions. Um, got new health facilities um, in Spartanburg, got new educational facilities in Spartanburg. After he did all of this, he ended up being a, a state uh, representative. Um, he's retired from that now, um, but just an amazing body of work. Um, and he has a, there is a process that EPA touts um, that sort of describes the work that he did, and it's called collaborative problem solving. Um, so they were holding these industries accountable, but also uh, in doing so, we're still able to meet with them at the table to talk about community wants and demands and needs. Uh, and ultimately, they were able to get the, the companies to be responsive after a while, um, leverage federal resources and other things. Um, so in terms of lessons learned, I would just say that it's it's all about kind of layering of strategies, multiple strategies. So, you know, like the regular, you know, um, tried and true, you know, advocacy strategies that we were just talking about. Um, these citizen and community science strategies are really important. Um, applying pressure just wherever you can, you know, um, I think, you know, we're in a time right now um, where in terms of, you know, federal government um, from the EPA on up, you know, there's kind of this a whole of government approach uh, to environmental justice. Um, they're still kind of figuring things out, but at least, um, you know, folks are oriented that way. Um, and so now is really a good time to, you know, dig in, um, and to be engaged, um, you know, both uh, at the community level, but also with these government agencies like EPA and the Council for Environmental Quality, who now have these mandates um, to elevate issues of environmental justice and who have mandates to work specifically on the climate crisis uh, and, you know, to look at those root causes and how some communities are being disproportionately burdened. Thank you so much. Uh, I think our time is up, but uh, what a wonderful uh, presentation. You, you've really given us a lot of great ideas and uh, pathways that perhaps uh, many of us didn't think about. And uh, we really appreciate your joining us today, Dr. Jelks, and wish you all the best in your endeavors, especially uh, the project you showed us on September 4. We wish you all the best with that. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. All right. So our viewers, uh, we will now have a lunch break uh, and we will uh, resume at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time uh, with our next speaker. Uh, and I hope you will join us at 2 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much.